All right, there might be some more coming, but uh, I will kick this off really quick. Um, a few housekeeping. Thank you, first of all, thanks to all of you for joining the Wisconsin ACEDS chapter presentation today, um, which is focused on understanding blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and non-fungible tokens, which I may have completely butchered the pronunciation. Of that. You're good. <laughs> Um, we are thrilled to have Justin Webb with us. I'm going to address a couple of um, housekeeping items quickly, and then I will um, have Justin introduce himself um, and give you a little background and jump into his presentation. Um, to start, I just wanted to let all the Wisconsin chapter members know that we are not going to have an August meeting, but it's beginning in September. We have a number of... Um, September is gonna be a new membership focused meeting. And then we have actually in-person events planned for October, November, and December. So we're really excited to finally get to see everyone in person. And please look forward to additional information coming from us on that. Um, in addition, ACEDS is sending out a national survey asking for um, feedback on what you're getting out of your chapter, I would, I will send, I'll forward that on to the chapter folks. Um, please participate in that. I think that'll give us valuable information. We've had a, you know, as you all know, last year has been a lot of Zoom meetings, but we're really interested now that things are opening up in learning what we can do um, going forward to provide really meaningful education for everyone. So please participate in that survey. Um, and I think that that is basically the news that I've got um, in terms of housekeeping items. As I mentioned, Justin Webb from Godfrey and Khan was kind enough to join us today and present um, blockchain, cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens. Um, he is the chair of the Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice Group at, at Godfrey and has a multitude of, of accreditations behind him. So with that, I'm going to let Justin introduce the, himself and his program. Thank you so much for participating today. Yeah, thanks, Kat. Hey, everybody. I'm Justin Webb. Um, as Kat said, I'm uh, an attorney at Godfrey and Khan. Um, in addition to being a practicing data privacy and cybersecurity attorney, um, I'm also the firm's chief information security officer. Um, so the presentation today is understanding blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and non-fungible tokens. Um, and I'll try and go through each one of those um, kind of at a, at a level um, that uh, has an eye towards sort of e-discovery, but also just generally um, understanding the technologies. Um, and one quick note at the beginning, um, if you have questions, please use the chat or Q&A function, um, and I'll try and answer them sort of in line. So if you have questions while I'm going through the slides, feel free to type a question in, um, and I'll try and answer it for everybody. Um, and this is an area that I typically see a lot of questions, um, and, um, you know, there's some sort of fundamental um, ideas that need to be understood to sort of understand it. Um, and so, you know, definitely ask questions and I'm very glad to be here and I thank um, everybody for joining. So what we're gonna talk about today um, is, first is what is blockchain um, and you know, which is the sort of technology underlying cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens, et cetera. Um, some of the use cases that have kind of come out for blockchain. Then we'll talk about cryptocurrencies sort of generally um, a little bit of the current regulations related to blockchain and crypto, um, some global legal and technology issues. Then we'll talk about what NFTs are. And finally, we'll talk about um, some e-discovery considerations um, and have uh, a conclusion. So um, I'm gonna launch into it. I've got a lot of slides and a lot to cover. Um, and this is probably, the next three slides are probably the most important ones um, in the entire presentation. Um, and the fundamental question is sort of what is blockchain? Um, and I think, um, you know, the most important point to sort of talk about is that it, it's really just software. Um, that's all it is. Um, and um, from a theoretical level, blockchain simply means 
that, and I'll use a bank as an example. So um, uh, a bank, when you go to the bank and you engage in transactions, the bank retains all of the transactions that all of its customers engage in. And it is the single sort of repository for all that information. And, and so in this diagram, you can see that that's sort of like a centralized network where they contain all of the information about those transactions. Blockchain is the one on the right, which is that it's a decentralized network. So instead of the bank keeping track of all of the transactions and what's going on um, amongst all of the customers, the customers keep track of all of the transactions and you don't actually need the bank at all. And I'm using bank here just as a, an example, but this can be applied to effectively everything. So um, that's really blockchain in a nutshell. It just means it's a decentralized network in which each participant has a copy of all transactions that have occurred. Um, and if you want to think about it like this, um, every person, every customer of that bank would have a copy of the bank's ledger. So how much money I put in, how much money I took out, how much money you put in, how much money you took out. Um, and so because everybody has a copy of the ledger, um, it's very hard to make changes to everybody's copy if you were trying to fake it. Um, and whenever a new transaction occurs, um, that ledger gets updated. Um, and everybody's spreadsheet or ledger gets updated with the additional transactions. So as you can imagine, that ledger slash spreadsheet is very large because it contains transactions for everybody, not just, you know, in, in the case of me dealing with my bank, my account statement just has transactions between me and the bank. Um, I would have what you put into the bank, what you took out, if you made payments, et cetera. Um, and that's really kind of the underlying um, you know, functionality of blockchain. Um, and then the other thing that's important about it um, is that when a transaction occurs and another block is added to the blockchain, um, it can't be changed. You can't go back and make edits to it. The transactions are irreversible. Um, and that also helps to prevent um, problems with um, changes to the blockchain or trust within the organization. Um, and trust in blockchain is built by um, various methods, but one of them is called a proof of work, which means you have sort of a mathematical function that's run on all transactions to verify that they're accurate before it is propagated to all of the spreadsheets slash ledgers. So they all get updated. So this is a kind of a nice diagram um, I think that's really helpful. And we'll kind of walk through this quickly about blockchain. So like I talked about, the, the first step is somebody requests a transaction. Um, we'll use the bank example again. Um, and the transaction is broadcast, you know, across all of these nodes to every person who's involved in the blockchain. Um, there's a verify um, section where the verification occurs as to the, whether the transaction is valid. Um, once it is, that gets added to the ledger, and that's why they call it a blockchain. So each transaction um, is part of a block or a single block itself, and it turns into a chain that gets pieces added to it. And that's really all blockchain is. And everything that underlies blockchain is just software. So if I am one of the nodes in a blockchain, I have a piece of software running on my computer, that's going out and getting updates to the ledger, getting the validation um, and helping me to be part of the network. And that's kind of it. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about sort of that fundamental process of blockchain, um, let me know because sort of everything else I'll talk about is sort of based on that idea. Um, so, you know, what is the benefit of a blockchain? You know, in my example, it removes the trusted intermediary. So there's no need for a bank anymore, right? If everybody's got a copy of all the transactions, you don't need a bank. Um, and that is one of the most attractive portions about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies um, is that there's no, ne there's no need for a trusted intermediary. And I'll give a quick, quick example um, about that. So if I own some cryptocurrency, um, and I'm exchanging it um, and engaging in transactions on the blockchain. And everybody knows what the value is of one Bitcoin 
or one Ethereum or any other cryptocurrency. If I live in a country that doesn't have a strong financial system where you might put money in the bank and when you go to take it out, it's not there anymore. Um, if you can store the money on the blockchain and you know buy cryptocurrency, you don't have those kinds of concerns. I can engage in transactions with anybody across the world um, and shoot money in real time from one place to another in Bitcoin. Um, and there's no trusted intermediary in which I have to put my faith in. You know, in the United States, we have like the FDIC that insures banks and all kinds of other banking regulations, but that's not the case um, across the world. And so it definitely democratizes aspects of commerce. Um, and it's got, you know, just a plethora of use cases. Cryptocurrency is one sort of use case, but um, there's all kinds of other ones. And we'll talk about non-fungible tokens. Um, and blockchain is effectively just based on mathematics and cryptography. So there's no real question about the underlying security of the technology, um, which is a really good thing. Um, and all it really is based on is software and running hashes of um, each of the blocks. So the way a blockchain kind of gets stacked up is um, a hash is taken of um, a particular block, um, and then that's added on to the block before it. And then every time a transaction occurs, a hash is taken again. That allows you to verify that a block is actually accurate. Um, and uh, if you're obviously, we're talking to a bunch of e discovery professionals um, and others, and I'm sure you're familiar with file hashes, the same concept in blockchain. Um, there's lots of hashing, it's a one way crypt cryptographic function. Um, it gives you a unique value for a set of data. Um, you know, it's key sensitive. Um, and that's really sort of everything that's underlying it. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about sort of like the types of blockchains, because this becomes sort of really important when you're thinking about um, this. And we had a question about whether the presentation will be available in PDF. Um, and I think Kat's going to answer that one, but I'm, I'm happy to make the presentation available. Um, if anybody wants a copy, you can always reach out to me. Um, I can send you one. Um, so there, there's what's called a permissionless blockchain, which is uh, like Bitcoin, which means anybody can get access to the blockchain at all. So tomorrow or today, you could go out and buy Bitcoin. There's no barrier to entry. You don't have to sign up for anything um, or do anything like that. Um, and there's also permissioned blockchains. Um, and that would be, and I'll talk about some of these examples later, where you actually do introduce a trusted intermediary again. Um, and that would be, examples of that would be like, you know, Walmart is using blockchain for its supply chain network. And so um, all of the information um, in that particular blockchain would be held by Walmart, but its um, participants would be things like its suppliers or retailers. And I have a very good example of this. Um, a little farther on, um, which would be this, like examine your, uh, or imagine your Walmart and you want to track exactly what happens to a chicken um, that gets into your store in eggs or hot dogs or in an actual physical chicken. Um, if you have information that starts from the farmer, goes to producers and distributors and retailers, everybody is on the blockchain and each time something happens with that chicken, like it's created into chicken nuggets or it's, you know, you take eggs from it, that's recorded on the blockchain. When it finally goes into a store at Walmart, an individual consumer or Walmart itself could look back and know the veracity of the records that underlie it, what happened to it at each chain of the transaction, um, and know that that information hasn't been changed, it's immutable, and it allows you to track things. And so you can imagine if you're a customer and say you want to know where an egg came from, the exact farm, who, who have everybody else who touched it, you could use blockchain for that. So that's one of the sort of interesting um, parts about it. And so that's the difference between permissionless and permission blockchains. Um, I want to talk a little bit about headwinds to blockchain technology. So, you know, a couple of years ago, blockchain was like the biggest thing in the world. Um, and there are lots of sort of um, comparisons to TCP IP, which is the technology that underlies the, underlies the internet. 
Um, the problem is that it's sort of built on, or it's associated a lot of times with Bitcoin. Um, and while Bitcoin's value has gone up considerably since back when I was playing around with it and should have bought a lot more of it, um, you know, there's been a lot of fraud, price volatility. It's used in lots of, um, you know, by cyber criminals. Um, and a lot of that affects blockchain's reputation. Um, there's also been a lot of sort of enforcement by the SEC and kind of like shady initial coin offerings. And if you're not familiar with what an initial coin offering is, a lot of times companies, um, instead of doing an IPO, which is like, you know, a public offering of securities, um, you know, when somebody goes onto the New York Stock Exchange, um, like a unicorn startup, um, people offer initial coin offerings, which is you get to buy their coin and it's a way for a company or an entity or anybody else to raise money. Um, and there was a lot of fraud that occurred in a lot of these initial coin offerings. Um, and they were used as a shortcut to actually issuing securities like sharers. Um, and people got built out of a lot of money. And so the SEC has been sort of smacking around ICOs for a while. Um, the other thing is that there are, there are considerable flaws in blockchain. Um, when it first came out, if you had a startup that just had blockchain in its title, or you talked about it in a, um, you know, a, a pitch, you, your valuation would probably go up like 3x. Um, but the reality was that blockchain just doesn't work for a lot of solutions. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Actually, we have a question that asks, does it build like a pyramid, the blockchain? It just builds like, you know, there's a block here, you had one here, one here, one here, and it keeps going on and on and on in like a chain. Um, so there's no sort of pyramid function. It's just building one after another. Um, and I'll talk about sort of how that works in practice um, in just a little bit. Um, but let's talk about sort of current use cases for um, blockchain. Right now, um, there is virtual currency. So people hear about Bitcoin all the time. You may have heard of Ethereum. Um, there's things like Dogecoin, um, which is actually a piece of cryptocurrency meant to make fun of um, uh, uh, different um, cryptocurrencies as well. There's also the supply chain example that I talked about, you know, with Walmart or any other retailer. Um, there's something called smart contracts, which... Um, there have been there's been a lot of chat about that in the legal world and and whether smart contracts are going to replace lawyers altogether. Um, and if you're not familiar, a smart contract is just a contract built entirely in code that's self-executing and therefore does not require um, lawyers theoretically. Um, and effectively, it's meant to make like all transactions entirely digital. So instead of um, me paying you a thousand dollars for a car you give me the car and we record that on a contract in a written document. Um, instead, we would write a function um, and the function would be that, you know, if I pay you $1,000, then you deliver the car to me and it's all um, part of a smart contract um, and it's all written in code. Um, and so there could be tons of uses for that as well, um, which is like facilitating payments and doing a whole bunch of other things. Um, the other, the other use cases are corporate records. There are multiple states that have said that you can now store your corporate records on the blockchain. Um, and keep in mind, if it's immutable, it can't change and you can't delete anything, um, obviously that would be helpful for things like stock records, corporate records, et cetera. Um, and then another use case will be NFTs and I'll talk a little bit about that um, later. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about cryptocurrencies. Um, I think this is the area where I get a lot of questions. Um, and keep in mind, cryptocurrencies are just one type of an implementation of blockchain, and it's the most common one. But really, what is a cryptocurrency? The answer is um, it's just the exchange of money via the blockchain. So Bitcoin, for example, um, uh, is just a, sorry, I was looking at some of the questions down here. I want to make sure I'm answering them. But um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is just a cryptocurrency. So effectively, it's, a, it's a, a measure of value that you can exchange with somebody else. And to get one Bitcoin, you have to exchange it for fiat currency. So if I put in $20,000 or whatever the current price is for Bitcoin, I get one Bitcoin. 
Um, and there are all kinds of different cryptocurrencies. There's Ethereum, Dogecoin, uh, Monero, all kinds of other ones. Um, some of them are pegged to the value of fiat currency. And what that means is um, that the value of the Bitcoin or uh, uh, sorry, cryptocurrency itself is tied to the value of a fiat currency like the United States dollar or the Canadian dollar or any other worldwide currency. And those are referred to as stable coins because the value is pegged to something that's known and stable. Um, Bitcoin, on the other hand, is not pegged to something stable. Um, its main value is derived from its scarcity um, and the fact that there are only a limited number of Bitcoin and it's derived from the fact that it takes computing power to mine Bitcoins um, and to run all the mathematical functions. And so part of its value is based on the scarcity of computing resources as well um, and how much math and computing transaction it takes to mine them. So a lot of people are like, you know, but what is a Bitcoin? Like, what's its value? And I think the answer is it's based in math. It's based on scarcity. But in some sense, it's based on what you believe it to be. Um, and that's why there's been a lot of fluctuation and craziness that's happened with Bitcoin's value. Um, and just to sort of elaborate on the mining function of this, you might hear people say, oh, you know, this guy's doing Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining. All that means is that the person is executing the mathematical um, uh, transactions necessary to validate each block on the on the blockchain. So, for example, if I'm mining uh, Bitcoin, I'm running like GPUs or other computers to validate all the transactions. Um, and by doing that, I get paid out in um, portions of Bitcoin. So if I have a whole bunch of computers running lots of computations and I'm the first one to calculate it for um, on the blockchain that I get a, a measure of Bitcoin in, in response. So effectively, you're just using computing power to get paid for it. Um, and you're helping with the trust of the over underlying blockchain because you're validating all of the transactions. Um, cryptocurrencies can be used to facilitate payments. So there are lots of entities that have decided to start um, accepting payment in cryptocurrencies. Um, there are now Bitcoin um, ATMs where you can literally walk up, deposit a $100 bill and get portion of Bitcoin back into your wallet. Um, and that brings me to another sort of question I get a lot, which is where do you sort of store said Bitcoin? Um, keep in mind again, like the point of Bitcoin and blockchain in some respects was to get rid of trusted in intermediaries. So you do not need to store Bitcoin in the bank. Um, instead, you store it in something that's called a wallet, which is just an electronic piece of software um, that it contains an encryption key that allows you to maintain um, the cryptocurrency that you bought, whether it's Bitcoin, Monero, whatever. Um, and you can either store that on your own computer um, in a wallet, or you can store it with a company like Coinbase, which is the company a lot of people use to trade in cryptocurrency or to hold cryptocurrency. And they can hold the wallet on your behalf instead of you holding it. Um, there's also a concept called cold storage, which means you can actually take the cryptocurrency offline completely. Um, and some people do this because of all of the sort of security issues with fraud related to cryptocurrency. So that means you literally put it onto a physical device. You can bury it in your backyard or hide it under your bed, um, but that prevents it, it from being stolen from you um, and takes you off of the actual network itself so that no shenanigans can go on. Um, and ironically, what a lot of people have been doing with cold storage is actually putting it into um, uh, the bank in a deposit box, um, and, which is kind of ironic given that the idea of this was to democratize sort of value and the exchange of money and to get rid of banks completely. Um, and there was this huge argument that like cryptocurrency will wipe out banks, which may or may not be true. But I just think it's funny that people are still relying on banks to actually deposit this. Um, and um, the irony of it is not lost on me. So let's talk a little bit more about current use cases. This is just kind of a diagram of the things I talked about. Um, you've got smart contracts on one side, and it can be used for things like notarization, 
um, securities. Um, I talked about corporate records um, and you know debt and equity. And there's tons of things um, that can be uh, done on the securities side. There's lots of speculative um, equity transactions in cryptocurrency. There's arbitrage, all kinds of stuff. In the record keeping side, um, healthcare records, voting records, um, stock records can be stored on the blockchain. Um, and then there's the digital currency side for lending, payments, e-commerce, et cetera. Um, we got a question, um, how is the blockchain updated if the user puts the coin in cold storage? So the blockchain keeps getting updated, but your actual wallet and the ability to engage in transactions is not live on the internet. So it'd just be like pulling the network cord out of your computer so that it doesn't actually update. When you plug it back in, before you can engage in transactions, it actually has to update all of the entire blockchain and download all of the information in the ledger before you can do that. Um, so it doesn't actually like make any changes. So the, 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 the transaction is recorded in Bitcoin on the blockchain that you've received that money and then you're just effectively taking it offline until you decide to sort of use it again, if that makes sense. Um, I talked about this supply chain example. The other example that was talked about a lot sort of when blockchain was hot was digital health records. Um, and actually some of the laws that were passed um, as part of COVID um, have kind of made this a little bit of a reality, um, which is think about having your health record um, and maintaining it yourself instead of having it at, you know, this quick care facility, um, this hospital you know, this primary care physician, they all kind of have a copy of your medical record and sometimes they don't all talk to each other. If you personally instead had that health record on a blockchain and could share it with your doctor when you wanted to or not, um, and it could be provided to other people, but you kept control of that health record, you knew what was in it, nobody could make changes to it. Um, that's kind of the idea on the healthcare side. And it would allow sort of health records to be maintained by the person who has the most interest in the information, which is you. Um, so there was another question. Does each cryptocurrency have one single blockchain? Yes. So like Bitcoin is on its own blockchain. Um, Ethereum is its own, you know, its own blockchain. Monero is a separate blockchain. Um, and if you want to make a transaction from one to another, you use a cryptocurrency exchange, which effectively is an exchange that takes um, money from one um, blockchain and takes it into another, or, or a good way of um, stating it is it's translating um, one cryptocurrency into another. So it's just like any other exchange. Um, Uh, and then we've got another question in the supply chain example. How do you ensure that data that one provider gives um, is accurate? Who audits this before the hacker code is created? Um, that's typically maintained by the trusted people that are on the chain. So in the, in the permission sense, in the example of Walmart providing sort of, you know, a supply chain, this example here, um, there has to be inherent trust between the farmer, Walmart, distributors, et cetera, about the product. Um, so what you get is a transaction record of what's occurred with the product, but what they put in there um, is not controlled by the blockchain. It's just verified that they entered that entry in at that time, and it can't be created later. So a good example would be, let's say nothing bad is happening, the farmer, the producers, the distributors all describe what happened to the product. And then let's say there's a recall um, and all that information is stored on the blockchain. So nobody could deny sort of what they've done with those products once it's stored on there. So they couldn't change records or argue that it wasn't them after you've received the product, which is one way to have sort of validity in the blockchain. Um, but there still is meant to be trust between these parties in a permission chain. And that's why it's called permission instead of public. Um, so I talked earlier about the idea of smart contracts. Um, and again, the idea is that they're self-executing agreements that are programmed on top of the blockchain. So um, it's just contracts that are self-executing. 
most of them are on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and like I said, there was a lot of hype about smart contracts replacing lawyers entirely. But the reality is, even if you had a contract that was entirely in code, um, that doesn't mean that you don't need lawyers to interpret all the meets and bounds of it. So what happens if the code um, doesn't execute properly? Or what happens if somebody you know, misprograms the smart contract? Who's liable for that? Um, and the thing about smart contracts is they make total sense in very limited and small scenarios. So again, if the idea is that the smart contract will say, if I pay Matthew, um, one of the attendees, um, you know, $5, he'll provide me back, um, you know, a JPEG image. Um, that would be an easy contract to create in code because it's just an if then statement, which is regular sort of coding practice. But if it's very complicated, and most contracts are, and most contracts have terms that account for all kinds of bad things happening, that's what lawyers get paid to do is sort of work, think about the parade of horribles and contract around them. Those things don't still happen in a smart contract. So if the agreement between me and Matthew um, is that I give him $5 and for 10 years he delivers me a certain amount of products, the smart contract can't necessarily account for what happens if an earthquake hits, um, you know, his plant? Or what happens if, you know, laws change and he can't deliver the products? Um, and so while it makes sense in sort of narrow spheres, um, it's going to be a long time before we get to a point where you could do complex contracts um, on via smart contract. Um, this is sort of an example of kind of basic smart contracts. Um, the basic smart contract example on here is that a landlord can remotely lock a non-paying tenant out of their apartment. So you can imagine you could program a smart contract to say, you know, payment must be received for this apartment. And if not, there's an electronic door uh, or electronic lock on the door. And at 12.01 AM, if payment's not received, that thing locks and you can't get into the apartment. That would be a very simple example. There are like very, very, um, elaborate examples and things like digital autonomous organizations that are probably outside the scope of this presentation, but they would be sort of like automated organizations that are executing and doing things fully based on contracts that are programmed on the blockchain. Um, and just quickly, you know, smart contracts raise all kinds of interesting legal questions. Um, if it's truly the case that it's all code, um, then would judges need to know object code to interpret a contract that was written um, and that was smart? Um, there's lots of questions about how the statute of frauds would apply. So um, if you're not familiar, statute of frauds effectively says if things aren't you know, in the four corners of the contract, then they can't be introduced into evidence effectively in a, in a contract dispute. Um, but if you have humans programming code and there's a dispute about the code, then you're probably going to need the humans to talk about the code or hope that the judge is um, a former programmer, which is probably highly unlikely. Um, the other interesting question would be if, if all contracts are now being coded and those are being done by programmers, are they engaging in the unlawful practice of law by writing contracts um, that should be and you know, advising people on what the code should be. Um, and there's all of these other kinds of sort of interesting um, and hypothetical legal questions. We're not really at a point where um, you know, these can sort of be brought into reality, um, but there are a few examples that are sort of outside the scope of this presentation. And, and the other question that's kind of interesting is, can you breach sort of a smart contract that's purely in code? Um, since, you know, the old adage is, you know, computers only do what you tell them to do. So if the code does everything that it's supposed to, it, theoretically, you couldn't have a breach of the agreement, right? Because it's automated. Um, so I'll, I'll leave those nuggets there for a little while. Um, so I want to talk just quickly about sort of regulation in the world of crypto and blockchain. Um, and in some, some sense, it's sort of the regulatory wild, wild west. With respect to cryptocurrencies, the IRS has issued tax guidance and stated that they're property, not currency. Um, and that means that you have to pay tax on any cryptocurrency that you sell at the end of the year, just like you would have to pay tax on any property. 
Um, and you're supposed to report that to the IRS. Um, and I think a lot of people who became crypto millionaires um, hopefully reported the lots of money that they made to the IRS um, and they may get a big um, bill in the future. Um, it's not given legal tatter, tender status by any government. Um, so it's not treated as like a dollar or anything else. Um, there are AICPA um, comment letters out about um, how you audit companies with respect to virtual currencies. Um, and the IRS has come out recently and said they're gonna start requiring the reporting of transactions in excess of $10,000 to the IRS. So for example, right now, if you go into a bank and you deposit more than $10,000 or take out more than $10,000, that gets uh, reported to the IRS for potential tax purposes. But if you go to a cryptocurrency exchange and uh, sell $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, that doesn't get reported to anybody. Um, and so the reason why they're doing that is because there's this entire market of transactions that's not sort of having a lot of regulatory oversight. And the only way to do that is to start getting that information flowing in, um, you know, to, to the IRS. Um, there's also been regulations that say that cryptocurrency exchanges have to do, um, you know, anti-money laundering and know your customer checks. So, you know, you can't um, run an exchange and allow people that are on the OFAC list or other sort of um, terrorist watch list, et cetera, to trade in cryptocurrency. And there's a lot of concern that because of the anonymity of um, Bitcoin, which is a large function of it, um, that it's hard to track whether criminals are using it. And that's probably something important I should have mentioned. So at least with respect to Bitcoin, the other sort of advantage of it is in addition to having all of the transactions permanently sort of recorded in public, um, is that it's anonymous. So the only thing that you see on the blockchain on the ledger is a random address exchanging money with another, um, per, you know, another address. You don't see like, you know, Matthew sending five Bitcoin to Justin. Um, you just see like a string of numbers and letters sending that to another person. Um, and you can imagine why the IRS uh, doesn't like that because they have no idea where this money is going, who it's going to. It could be going between two individuals in the United States or two people in um, you know, Iran and North Korea. Um, and obviously the government would have an interest in that because it could allow lots of um, sanctions um, and other financial restrictions to be easily avoided. Um, and obviously there's an interest in not having that happen. Um, the other thing I, I talked about earlier, it's sort of the idea of initial coin offerings. Um, the SEC has kind of put out a lot more regulation on this front. And again, initial coin offering would be like, I'm Justin, I want to, I have a new company and I want to raise money. Um, and instead of doing like a series A funding round or going out and getting investors, instead I sell Justin coin. Um, and for just a hundred dollars, you can buy Justin coin um, and that will help me fund the company. Justin Coin will have independent value in the performance of Justin's company. Um, and therefore, you're just making an investment. Um, and there are a lot of these uh, Justin Coins out there. Um, and some of them were related to companies that had no business plan um, and that were tied to the future value of the company. Um, and in SEC sort of regulatory speak, that looks a lot like an investment contract which is I pay you money and what I'm effectively getting back is some value based on the future performance of the company. Um, and that's a no-no unless you file with the SEC um, that you're actually providing investments to private parties or others. Um, and so the SEC has sued a lot of initial coin offerings um, and um, uh, kind of gone through um, a lot of regulatory um, front of this, and I like to talk about sort of there's a there's a huge legal malpractice risk with ICOs. There are some firms out there that do a really good job on this front and that know all about sort of the regulatory framework. But there are a lot of people that were helping companies to do ICOs that had absolutely no business doing it whatsoever. Um, and there was a lot of potential legal malpractice kind of being committed. So uh, fun fact there. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, we talked again about sort of like the democratization of the exchange of money by cryptocurrencies. 
Um, one of the other things that we've seen recently is that banking regulators, both in the states and in um, at the federal level, have started telling banks, both federally chartered banks and in some cases state chartered banks, that they can actually engage in cryptocurrency. So they can exchange it. So I could walk into US Bank, um, not now, but probably in the future, give them $100 and they could exchange back to me you know, one Bitcoin that I can put in my personal wallet. Um, they can also hold cryptocurrency assets. So we talked about before, um, you know, I take my money into cold storage and I put it in a safe deposit box. They're permitted to do that, but they're also permitted to actually hold the cryptocurrency in an account at the bank as well. Um, and they're also allowed to use, allow customers to make payments um, over um, blockchain as well. Um, or sorry, over with Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. At this point, they're mostly focused on stable coins, which again are coins that aren't very speculative. They are coins that are based on the value of a dollar um, and that you can actually tie to some kind of fiat currency. But again, the irony here is that banks, um, perhaps sensing a little bit that cryptocurrency is the new game in town, um, want to stay involved um, in it and not sort of lose out on customers. Because you can imagine somebody who says, I don't want to have any money in a bank. I'll have all my money stored at Coinbase or in my wallet. Um, I'll engage in transactions in cryptocurrency. If I can't, I guess I'll you know go to a Bitcoin ATM and take out cash. Um, and that's attractive for a lot of people. It's sort of like the new gold, I guess you would say, if you um, want to watch the value of gold go all over the place a lot of time. Um, so other regulations that are kind of important, there are lots of state laws encouraging blockchain innovation. There are task force um, set up in states. Um, there are laws that govern sort of whether you can use blockchain to record um, transactions. So for example, um, uh, notary publics, whether they can use um, blockchain. There are also laws that talk about the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, um, which allows you to do electronic signatures um, and electronic records. So, you know, when you do something uh, with DocuSign, um, they have certain provisions uh, there that are meant to sort of comply with the UETA. Um, and there's a number of states that have said you can use the blockchain as the electronic record and validation of an electronic signature. So if I execute a transaction on the blockchain, that counts as my electronic signature for purposes of an electronic record. Um, and there are a number of states that also allow blockchain records for corporate records. So I talked about the example of having shares be stored on the blockchain and you know distributed out to people on a permission blockchain. And there are states that allow you to do that. Um, there's also some interesting issues with blockchain. So one of them is whether or not, um, let's say for example, um, I wanna go and buy a house, right? And the, the uh, mortgage company asked me how much money I have in the bank. And I tell them, you know, I have $2,000 in my savings account, but I have $200,000 in my um, Bitcoin wallet. The question was whether you could use that as a security interest. So normally under the UCC, you can only use something as a security interest in which it's sort of stored with a trusted intermediary, like a bank. Um, and there were lots of people who held money in their Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency wallets who were saying, why can't we use this as you know, collateral effectively on a mortgage or on a loan? Um, there's some states that have said you can. One example would be Wyoming and others that said that you have can't. You can't. And the reason why they want that money to be in a bank um, is because there are transaction records. Um, and uh, typically it's harder to sort of go to a bank and take out large sums of money than it is to transfer it over crypto um, transactions. But does it really matter whether where you're holding it? Um, and then the, the, the further question on that is, does it matter whether it's in my personal wallet or with a company like Coinbase, which is like a cryptocurrency exchange? Um, and does that matter for purposes of the security interest? Um, so anyways, I think that's an interesting one. Um, so somebody asked a question about the law of wills and inheritance um, and whether the law has caught up with how it works with respect to the next of kin and obtaining like the wallet and Bitcoins. 
I think the answer to that is, I don't know how that's actually kind of working in probate, but I would imagine if you do have um, Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, you would want to list that in your will and you would absolutely want to list the um, encryption key to your uh, wallet because even if you have $200,000 there, if you lose the encryption key or don't pass that on to your relatives after your death, nobody's going to be able to get into your wallet and that money will just sit there. Um, and that's another function of sort of cryptocurrencies in the blockchain that I think people lose a lot of sight of. Um, if you lose the encryption key to your wallet, you lose that money. It will just sit there forever. You cannot access it. It's effectively like losing your password to your wallet. Um, and it will never be sort of, again, you cannot exchange it out. You cannot engage in any transaction. There is no bank to go to and show a death certificate um, or beg them to give you the money because you're the son of the person that died. Because it's permissionless and everybody has a copy of the ledger, no such thing. So there have been a ton of people who have, and there are tons of stories if you search online for like, um, you know, lost my Bitcoin or lost my cryptocurrency. There are tons of stories about people losing millions of dollars because they forgot the encryption key to their wallet. Um, they failed to store it or it got wet or, you know, they didn't have an extra copy of it. And that money is just there forever and they can never get access to it. So you learn nothing else. Do not lose that. Store it in multiple places um, and think about putting it into your will. Good question. Um, so I want to run through, I think I'm going to kind of skip through a few of these slides because I want to talk about NFTs real quick and I want to get to the e-discovery portion of this. So I'm just going to kind of run through these real quick. You know, one of the things about blockchain that's interesting is because um, it's decentralized and, you know, people in Iran, North Korea, the United States and Canada would have all have a copy of the ledger on a public blockchain. Um, uh, um, effectively, what that means is that everything's decentralized, right? And we talked about decentralization in the beginning. Um, and effectively, what that means is that, like, let's say I wanted to sue somebody over things that occurred on the blockchain. I might be needing to sue somebody in Iran, somebody in North Korea, and somebody in multiple places. Um, and so the question about the jurisdiction over a conflict like that um, may have a lot of different places because it is de decentralized. There's another also interesting privacy law issue with um, blockchain generally. I said earlier that once a block gets put on the chain, it can't be taken off, it can't be changed, nothing can be done with it. Um, and if you're familiar with some of the European privacy laws like GDPR, um, you know, a lot of those laws, including CCPA, provide a right um, to have your information deleted. Well, that is fundamentally incompatible with blockchain because blocks are immutable and cannot be changed. So there's no way to correct the information. So once you write a block, you can't go back and correct it, even if you made a mistake. And you certainly can't delete it because it will break the entire chain if you do. Um, and so it causes issues with privacy if there were potentially personal information on the blockchain. So again, in the example of your health records, if you wanted to delete a record, no such thing. Um, now you can write software on top of the blockchain to give you the ability to do that. Um, but then it kind of gets a little bit away from sort of underlying blockchain technology. Um, the other thing I think it's important to sort of mention quickly is you know, just because blockchain has, you know, lots of good things like the transactions don't change, it's decentralized, it's immutable, um, doesn't mean that it's a good um, solution for everything. Um, and this has kind of been borne out by the blockchain sort of hype and then things coming back down to earth because there are a number of problems with the inability to scale blockchain. So again, let's talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin's ledger at this point in time has every single transaction that's ever occurred that involves a, you know, a Bitcoin. So every transaction involving one Bitcoin or more is being recorded on this ledger. And at this point in time, the ledger is multiple gigabytes large. So when you first get on to um, the um, you know, Bitcoin and you get a wallet, when you download the ledger, it takes a while. 
And you can imagine that if, if the tra each transaction needs to be verified, if the file is multiple gigabytes long and you have to run hundreds of thousands, if not millions of transactions and hashes to validate a new transaction, it takes much, much longer as it gets bigger. And that's one of the fundamental problems is that the ledger just keeps growing and you effectively will run out of space at some point in time, or it will become so taxing on computer resources that will effectively be useless. Um, so I think um, th that's one of the things that's always been limitations. So th the question there is, we have relational databases like Oracle, um, you know, an Excel spreadsheet um, that you can make changes to, that you can make transitions for, that you can delete information from, that you can correct. And so those things still are the best solution for a lot of problems. Not everything needs to be on the blockchain, I guess is the answer. Um, the other thing is there's a problem with anonymity, right? So if you have people who are engaging in criminal transactions, um, you, there's no way to track them. Um, the answer is there actually are ways to track them, but they're with sophisticated analysis by third-party companies. Um, and there are um, cryptocurrencies like Monero where there's no record of anything that happens on it whatsoever. It's not public and you can't tie it to a single individual. And so um, cyber criminals really love um, a cryptocurrency called Monero because you can't see any of those records. But how do you identify perpetrators who are committing crimes if you don't know who's behind a single address? And there are ways to sort of send your money out into the fog, you know, launder it through a bunch of Bitcoin addresses and get it back, um, which can also cause problems. Um, so let's talk about non-fungible tokens for a second. This is sort of the new hot thing on blockchain. Um, and let's just talk about the word fungible for a second. So fungible means things that can be exchanged one for one with something else, right? And they can be, and it's something that's identical. So if I have one US dollar, I can give it to you. You give me one US dollar. We've not actually had anything change, right? They are interchangeable. Shares of a company are interchangeable as long as they are in the same class. Um, a, you know, one gram of gold is equal to one gram of gold. There's nothing different between those two things. Same thing with sweet crude oil. Oil is oil. Um, and so one barrel of oil equals one barrel of oil. There's nothing sort of different about those things. Non-fungible means it's unique. And so when you hear non-fungible tokens, we're talking about a unique token that somebody can purchase. Um, they're held on the blockchain. Um, and the major you know, function of the blockchain in the non-fungible token sense is to verify ownership of something. Um, and they're, they're held in a wallet, just like all other sort of cryptocurrencies or things on, on the blockchain. Um, and they could be anything. So the, the major stories with um, NFTs were a piece of art that was an NFT was sold for $69 million. Um, it was a one of a kind piece of digital art um, that was sold for $69 million. And what's recorded on the blockchain with non-fungible tokens is a single person's ownership of that piece of art. So the record is the ownership related to that. Other common and sort of big NFTs were NBA's Top Shot, which was allowing you to buy like highlights and certain other sort of like game memorabilia electronically from the NBA. Um, and the Major League and Major League Baseball just agreed to start doing NFTs also, where they're kind of going to sell like the same thing that NBA did, like, you know, memorabilia, etc. Keep in mind that for the most part, we're talking about digital memorabilia. So what a non-fungible token is in its simplest sense is like a picture, um, a piece of digital art, memorabilia, um, and you can exchange that for money. Um, and what's recorded on the blockchain again is your ownership of it. So a good example would be like, let's say I decide that I want to put my prom picture as an NFT. Um, and I can go out, put my prom picture out there and somebody can buy it. Um, and they'll have the only electronic copy of that picture. And normally what it requires is that the person who's selling it 
gives a guarantee that like, you know, this would effectively be the only electronic copy. But even that's not required. Um, it can also be something of value. Like you can buy an NFT that actually gets you physical tickets to a basketball game. Um, it can also be like incentives. Um, but the biggest area where it's been used right now is videos, still images, and memorabilia. Um, so if I create a digital piece of artwork and I sell it to you, I can sell it as an NFT. And what you get, what you actually get is a copy of the digital piece of artwork, so the JPEG or the image file, um, and a record on a particular blockchain that says you are the ownership of this, it proves the provenance, and that you're the only owner of it. But this is where it gets sort of interesting. So normally you're not transferring like actual physical ownership of a thing. So let's say I made an NFT of the Mona Lisa, right? Um, and uh, I decided to put that out there. And let's assume just for a second that I am the actual owner of the Mona Lisa, even though it's held in a museum. The NFT is normally just the digital copy and I'm selling that single digital copy of it and it would have inherent value because of its scarcity. Um, so it's the only digital copy of the Mona Lisa. But what you're not getting is the actual physical possession of the painting. You're not getting really anything else other than the, the ability to kind of show this digital copy and effectively tell your friends, I own the only digital copy of the Mona Lisa, aren't I cool? Um, and so the rights that you get in a particular NFT are rise and fall with the sort of agreement that the particular um, exchange that is selling NFT has or in a contract um, that relates to the selling NFT. So if you buy them online from one of the exchanges like NBA Top Shot or these MLB ones, effectively what the contract says is you get this digital copy you don't get any rights to the underlying video. So if it's a highlight of a basketball player, you don't actually get the physical video. And there are restrictions on how you can use it. So you can't like put it on television. You can't publicly display it in certain places. You can't claim ownership over it. Um, and so your rights are limited in the NFT. And so for a lot of people, they kind of don't really know what the whole point of it is. I think there are good uses um, and it can, can be interesting, but it raises a lot of questions. And NFTs were hot as hell. People were selling them for millions of dollars um, and it's kind of tanked a little bit um, in the middle of the market. Actually, I actually have a friend who bought an NFT for $3,500. I think he's a total idiot. Um, and he could have sold it right afterwards for about $10,000. Um, and instead he held on to it. And now I think it's worth absolutely nothing. So uh, lesson learned. But there are good uses for NFTs. And one example would be with truly digital art. Um, let's say I'm a digital artist and I wanna sell a piece of my artwork. I can make an NFT and sell it to somebody. And that would be the only copy of the digital artwork. And maybe my NFT allows this person to sell it to other people. Um, and that means maybe I get a cut every time the NFT is transferred to a new owner. But for the person that's holding the NFT, because all those records are on the blockchain and they're immutable, I have the pure provenance of that piece of digital art. I know who owned it, when it was traded. Um, and that can always be hard in the context of real art to know who the previous owners were, unless you have sort of like a book of sort of, you know, the provenance. The other thing to know about NFTs is it's different exchanges than like cryptocurrency or other sorts of types of blockchain. Um, they're like digital canny and a bunch of other places that allow you to sort of create and exchange NFTs. Um, and those places can define the meets and bounds of what you can and can't do with the NFT. Um, and effectively, the main benefit is it allows digital as opposed to paper transactions. Because keep in mind, I can still sell you a digital copy of a piece of artwork um, and hand you a JPEG on a USB stick and you can give me $100. The only difference is that it's actually recorded on some blockchain so that you can electronically prove that you're the only owner of that piece of um, art. The downsides, I think, are, is this really anything new? Um, not really. It's just using blockchain technology for memorabilia. 
Um, but it could make a lot of changes for things like baseball cards. So for example, if uh, baseball cards all become digital and you could prove who owned it, when they bought it, you could exchange it with your friends, there could be some value there. And there are other scenarios in which they can be valuable too. So that's a quick overview of NFT. So I know I'm a little bit over, but I just wanted to make sure I get into some e-discovery considerations here for this group. So with blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFT, whatever, you know, logs exist for all these kinds of things. There are records of the transaction um, on the actual ledger. Um, and keep in mind when you're doing e-discovery in this area, um, the transactions on most blockchains are public unless it's a permissioned blockchain. So Ethereum transactions, Bitcoin transactions, Monero, those are all um, public records. Sorry, Monero's not, but most um, of them are, <clears throat> but they are anonymous. So you may have to sort of do some work to figure out who it is. Um, there are techniques to track financial crimes, even on anonymous systems. There are companies like Chainalysis that can help you determine um, who engaged in certain transactions. They can watch them for you know, long periods of time. They have records of all transactions. So if you're trying to figure out who somebody is and you see money moving into a wallet, you can go to one of these companies that can help, help you. Um, if you're doing discovery on this, obviously um, information about an individual's wallet, whether it's hosted with Coinbase or with somebody else will be important. Um, and there's always plenty of places to subpoena or to get records. So, you know, if I um, am engaging in shenanigans with cryptocurrency, I could subpoena Coinbase and they get subpoenaed all the time for information in, in financial crime investigations. Um, and they have logs of transactions um, that are stored on the blockchain and they may have their own internal logs of who logged into an account, what their IP address was which be additional information in addition to sort of what's on the blockchain itself. Um, and keep in mind, um, there's an absolute e-discovery benefit to blockchain because it's immutable and it's using hashes. And that's a lot of sort of what's, what goes on in e-discovery, at least with respect to certain investigations. But the fact that you know that the information hasn't changed because it's stored on the blockchain is extremely value from an evidentiary perspective and a chain of custody perspective. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, like I talked about before, there are things called crypto tumblers and mixers, um, which actually allow you to sort of send your block, your Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies all out over the internet, shuffle it up a little bit, and then send it to a new account so you can't tell where the transactions were coming from. Um, and again, there are companies that can help you kind of work through that, but keep in mind that it can be extremely hard to sort of, you know, determine who exactly engaged in transaction. The other thing is that blockchain is the, you know, sort of underlying cryptography and math related to this. Um, and there is software, all kinds of software built on top of the blockchain. And there's logs from all of that kind of software. So in the e-discovery sense, those logs may be necessary. Um, information from a forensic capture of a computer might be necessary to determine what people are doing. Um, and um, a couple other quick points. The size of the blockchain means there's going to be lo loads of evidence to sort through. So, so, so for example, if you're going into, you know, uh, take a bunch of information and the entire, you know, Bitcoin ledger, when you download that, you're going to have a uh, you know gigabytes worth of data. You're going to have to sort through to determine the specific address that you're looking for. Um, and in any other blockchain, you're going to have to download all the transactions, even if you're only looking for one. And that could mean that there's lots more data than you really want to uh, have. And I talked about this earlier, but you know the the question is always sort of like machine code being law. So if you get into discovery of smart contracts you might actually be discovering software code, um, which gets a little interesting um, in the context of just discovery in general, if the code is actually the discovery material. Um, but the answer is, at the end of the day, this is no different than anything else, right? It's just software. There are logs. There are places to look um, at and, you know, sort of rocks to look under. Um, and my normal advice is, 
not to sort of treat this as something so different that you can't get into it or understand it. Of course, there are tons of nuances, but everybody is capable of sort of understanding these things. Um, you know, if you want to be a crypto millionaire, you know, you can get into Bitcoin right now um, and, um, you know, start making money or maybe lose all your money. Um, but it's an interesting place to be. There's a lot of cool things happening. Um, and there's a lot of pitfalls because there's also a lot of fraud, a lot of tricksterism. Um, I don't think that's a word, but I just made it up. Um, and that's pretty much the conclusion. So it's just software, lots of regulations going on, a role for lawyers and e-discovery professionals, um, and NFTs, an interesting um, place with a lot of hype. And there are some potential interesting uses, but also, um, as with anything, lots of people getting duped into buying digital crap um, that might not be worth anything. So I wanted to thank everybody for uh, attending. I'll hang out for just a little bit um, to answer any follow-up questions, um, but thanks everybody for joining. And I just wanna follow up and say thank you so much, Justin. This was <clears throat> really very interesting. The fact that we still have 67 people 10 minutes later really isn't a tribute to um, the content. So appreciate it very much. Um, to all of the folks on, that have requested a copy of the presentation and or recording, I will get that out. Um, the recording is usually made available to us in a couple of days. And as soon as that's available, I will send both to the entire, you know, to everyone that registered. So um, with that, I know that there were a few additional questions. I don't know if you got to all of them. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll run through. I don't know if the individuals are still on, but I'll run through them. So um, the, the first question is, if you lose your wallet, can you create another one? Um, you can, but you cannot, you know, take what was in the lost wallet with the lost encryption key and put it in the new one. Um, you can create as many wallets as you want on Bitcoin. You can hold some money in this wallet, some money in that. Um, it's just like opening accounts at a bank. You can have as many as you want, uh, but you can only access the ones that you can physically get access to. Um, with respect to multiple owners of an NFT, um, I would assume, yes, you can. Um, uh, with a caveat that normally you have a wallet to a person or entity. So I think normally if you wanted to have multiple owners of an NFT, you would just have a company own it. Um, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't have multiple owners, understanding that there's just going to be one record on the blockchain about who owns it. Um, and it'll be one address, you know, one identifier, something like that. Um, uh, there's another question about whether cryptocurrency falls under IP rights. Um, I don't think so. Um, uh, I think, you know, for the most part, cryptocurrency is just kind of treated as um, non-legal tender property. Um, and there could be situations in which it does. And I think um, like blockchain could, but not necessarily cryptocurrency. And I think that was the last question. If you have any else, I'll hang out for any more, sorry. Um, I'll hang out for another four or five minutes. Um, but again, I want to thank everybody for attending and I hope you have a great day. All right, looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, so thanks everybody for the very nice comments. Um, and um, you know, if you have any questions, you can always shoot me an email afterwards. Um, thanks everybody. Thanks again, Justin. This was terrific, really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely.